good to have, can we welcome this illustrious panel here? <laughs> illustrious. We, we have a panel, don't we? Come on. So let me introduce you to who's here today, because I was thinking about Father's Day and what we do. And over here on my far left is Josh Kelly. Most of you perhaps know him. Uh, he is our son. He is our second born child and he is married now with two children, a daughter and a son. And you've been in church your whole life. You've been brought up in church um, and you come from a background where your mother and father so far have stayed married. <laughs> I thought that was funny myself. And uh, I don't think we've got any plans anytime soon to do anything different about that, darling. I think we're all good. And so there's, there's, there's the first person I want to introduce you to. The second one right here, Joe Riddle. Just give us a wave, Joe, so people know. Uh, Joe's part of our preaching team. And Joe is married with three children, uh, two sons and a daughter. You recommitted your life at Wave Church and you come from a broken family. We're gonna share a little bit about that. And then right here, the little guy, little John. This is Josh Coxwell. He has two children, a daughter and a son. You got saved when you were a teenager and you come from a broken family. Your mother passed away when you were 16, I think. Is that right? And then over here, Bobby, give us away, Bobby, our Wilson campus. Come on all Wilson, shout out your campus pastor down there in Wilson who are watching. Bobby's married, three children, two boys and a girl. You got saved in your senior year of high school and you come from a broken family where your father committed suicide. We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna just see how did you deal with that. And then this is Kino Paraiso, the thriller from Manila. <laughs> Kino, you knew that was coming, didn't you? Every time. Every time. And uh, Kino, by the way, uh, is our Richmond uh, short pump campus pastor and our downtown Richmond campus pastor. And uh, married, has three daughters. And, and another boy to come in Jesus' name, right, babe? No, not right now. I realize how that came across. My wife is not pregnant, everybody. Yeah. Well, we're pleased to hear that. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Um, that's called oversharing. And, uh, but you got saved at Wave. Yes. And you come from a broken family, and you've never met your father. Never met my biological father. That's never great. met him. So we're going to talk about that. And then Jared, who is our son-in-law, is actually on long service leave. He's our Norfolk campus pastor. It's not that he couldn't be up here. It's just that he's on long service leave, which is a good thing. First thing I want to say, and I want you to hear this. Everybody online, listen, stay focused, watch this. No one comes from a perfect family. Right. Yeah. No one does. No matter how good it looks, everybody has got their own story. Sharon and I had a married life, 38 years, and you could look at someone else's life and you could look at it and you can fall under a wrong impression that that other person, that, that other couple are perfect. Everybody has got their story. Are you hearing me? And so I love the scripture because the thought is we're all broken. Everybody is broken. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, no, not a one. No matter how good we can make our lives look, I gotta tell you, we've all got a story. Thank you for that underwhelming response. And so Psalm 68, this, I love this verse. He, God, <clears throat> is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in His holy dwelling. Watch, God sets the lonely in families. I love that. I think that's a picture of the church. He sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoner with singing, but the, the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. So let's go. Let's talk. Let's actually t hear a little bit about these guys' stories. And I'm going to start with Josh, but maybe just as an introduction to Josh, let me tell you, I'm Josh's dad, if you didn't know, and I come from a very broken family. My mother and father were both alcoholics. When I come home from school every day, the question would be, will mom be sober and will dad make it home? My dad owned a bar in Queens, New York. There was often blood on the walls. There was often police in our homes, a house. There was often 
turmoil, fighting. My father was also a gambler. At the age of about 55, my father finally confessed to my mother that all the money they thought they had in their retirement, all the money, the, the other properties that my father, my mother thought we had, there was none. That all the, not only did he have no money in retirement, not only did we not have all these other properties that my mother thought they had, but they were actually, this is going back 40 years ago, actually in $60,000 debt to gambling addictions. And that is where I come from. And so by the grace of God, Shannon and I both got saved when we were teenagers and we are first generation Christians. By the grace of God, Josh does not have to deal with what I had to deal with. And that is the grace of God. It is not me claiming to be a perfect parent. I promise you, I'm far from it. But by the grace of God, if any man be in Christ, watch this. Behold, he's a new creature. The old is gone and the new has come. And in my family, there's generations of alcoholism and bondage and addictions. But the moment I met Jesus, the generations get better in Jesus' name. So if you come from a broken family and a broken background, can I tell you, it all changes with you. Amen. Amen. I, I need to say that loud. And so, you know, thank God, Josh doesn't have that baggage. Um, and the guess my thought is, church works. Right. Yeah. Church works when we pass on our faith. So, um, Josh, the first thing I'd mention maybe today is that you rang me on Friday. It's our day off. And you asked me, to, um, to have a Father's Day round of golf. I did. Now, I know, by the way, that that has nothing to do with him necessarily wanting to spend time with his dad as much as he knows it's a free round of golf for him. Can I get an amen? <laughs> However, Josh, would you like to share about the game of golf on the back nine at Bay Creek uh, as to who won the back nine? You did win on the back nine. You played some of the best golf I have ever seen you play. I opened a can. You did. Eight birdie putts. Yeah, didn't make one of them. <laughs> I think he was praying. Um, so, Josh, obviously, you know, your story's a little bit different from everybody else up here because you yeah. grew up in church. Right. So I want to ask you a question, and you are our great Nick campus, and I want to say this. You're a great father. Mm. You really are. You're a phenomenal. I watch you, and I just love. I mean, you used to say to me when you were a little boy, I don't know if you remember it, Dad, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. Do you remember saying that? Yeah, partially because I knew I was your favorite child, but yes. <laughs> but I remember not understanding what he was saying because that was not my origin. I would never look at my father and say, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. I'm just saying the exact opposite. I'm just saying, when I grow up, I want to be nothing like you because my dad was never around. My dad was always in the bar. My dad was always drunk. I have no real memories um, with my father Growing up, none. He was always, he was never home. The only memory I have is when my, set, my sister fet, set fire to my other sister and she was in flames and my father put her out. That's one of the memories. But Josh, just talk for a minute, like as a dad, as, and not just as a dad, but just as a man of God, what are your top priorities about being a dad? Yeah, well, first off, uh, I need to, I said the wrong dates for summer camp. It's June 30th to July 2nd for any parents that were freaking out because I said the wrong dates. Um, but I think it, it was a cool question to think about what my priorities are as a dad. And, and I've learned these things from, you know, God's word and, and from being planted in God's house. Uh, and as well, I've had the honor and privilege to learn it from a dad that is, in my eyes, worthy of being honored. And I know what a blessing that is. Even talking about uh, having a dad that I can aspire to be like. I, I know that's not everybody's story. So understanding for me what a blessing that is. And I do want to honor you on Father's Day. And, and thank you for being the great dad that you are. How you've led our family. How you've led our church family. Especially these last two years. Come on, can we honor Pastor Steve? All of our campuses. And so I thought about, okay, what are my priorities as a dad? I think these are short-term and long-term uh, for me, and they're in no particular order of importance. But number one, a priority for me is, is to be a great husband. As a dad, it's to be a great husband, to show my kids what the love of God looks like and how I love their mom, and, and just to be a godly husband. I think other 
then my relationship with Jesus, the most important thing I can do and be is be a great husband. The second, and, and maybe this sounds a, a little cheesy, but I really believe it, is my priority is to train my kids as warriors. I see my kids as weapons for the kingdom of God. I really do. Psalm 127.4, I love this verse, says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. And I really believe that it is my job to raise my kids as weapons for the kingdom of, of, of God. God has trusted me with kids to shape and power and release to do all that God has called them to do. And I think about you know, people talk about, you know, making sure we make a difference in our community and in, in, in our nation around the world. But I think personally, the greatest difference I can make is not what I do, but how I raise my kids and being all that God has called them to do and be. Uh, the third thing would be is, is Jesus and the church. My job as a, as a dad is to ensure they love Jesus. I can't make them do that, but I can show them how to do that. And then as well, his church. And I know that I can't make them love church, but they, I can teach them that God's house is a non-negotiable for our family. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I learned that from, from you, and it's something I know is one biblical, but for my kids is that they will know whether they want to go to church or not. Growing up in church, I didn't always want, as a pastor's kid, I didn't always want to go to church, but I knew whether I liked it or not, we were going to church. And so church will be a non-negotiable uh, for our family. Another one priority for me is is to always have fun. Again, I learned this from you, is, is I want my kids to know every day that dad comes home from work, something fun and interesting is going to happen. No matter what kind of day I've had, I just want to remember to always enjoy and have fun in every season. And lastly, uh, a priority for me as a dad is to know what the, the word of God says. And uh, with all the nonsense the world and culture is pushing on the next generation, and no matter what they try to teach or not teach in school, uh, I'm reminded I am the most important teacher. And uh, I better know what I'm teaching. I better know what the Word of God says. So those are my priorities as a, as a dad. That's a great list right there, isn't it? That's, I mean, that's awesome. All right, so this is Bobby right here, Bobby Harrell. And uh, Bobby, tell me a little bit about your dad. I know you've got, you know, some real story here, and I'm looking for you to unpack it just a little. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I was, when I was born, my mom was a teenage mom, and my biological father was, a, I think, still a teenage father at that time. But during the time my mom was pregnant with me, uh, my dad and her split. They were married, and they split and started their divorce. And uh, when I was born, he was out of the picture at that point. My mom had custody, and my dad uh, got to see us every other weekend. And that happened for a season of our life, but throughout my uh, young years and teenage years, my, I was disowned, um, asked not to come over and visit, uh, I think three times. Uh, once and twice, it was just, hey, we, would, we don't want Bobby and Bradley to come to the house anymore, and that would stand for a year or two, and then we would come back, and then a couple times in the courts, maybe in an attempt to uh, save a little money on child support, even uh, asked not for us to be a part, or maybe I wasn't his child. And uh, when I was 16 years old, in between my junior and senior year of high school, I'll, I'll never forget the last conversation I ever had with my dad. He called, my brother was living at his house. I was not um, because I was a little angry and frustrated with him. Uh, for just um, life stuff, and he called, and he was looking for my mom because my brother was wanting to move back in with her, and in the conversation, as it's ending, he goes, well, Bobby, come by and see me sometime, and I said, yeah, sure, I'll try, knowing I wasn't planning to try, and then he says, okay, well, son, I love you, and I said, yeah, you too, and we hung up the phone, and the next morning, my mom comes into the room shakes me on the shoulder. She's like, Bobby, Bobby, wake up. And I open my eyes and, you know, I'm a teenager. I didn't want to wake up early that morning. And she looks at me and she says, Bobby, your dad shot himself last night. And I'm stunned. You know, the, the, the replay of everything happening, I'm stunned. And um, I asked, is he, is he alive? And she says, no. She says, will you help me tell your brother? I say, yes. Um, and that's, that's sort of how it happened. That's, that's the story. And then Obviously, the ramifications of that, the, the frustration, the forgiveness, I was mad at God, I was mad at my father, I was mad at the situation. You know, to be honest, I really couldn't even fully comprehend or understand why it would have happened, and um, I spent a few years probably navigating that emotion and that feeling. When, when you said 
were you also kind of feeling about you know, the last thing I said to my father was kind of indifferent as well? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, it still to this day, it's a conversation. Those words, those last words I ever said to him, it's something I'll never forget. Now, I don't hold anger or frustration with myself, but I do have an awareness that my words are important. You know, and you never, I mean, it might sound heavy, but you never know the last words you're going to say to somebody. So you had to forgive yourself. Exactly. And how did you do that? Um, well, I, I found Jesus, uh, Jesus found me, uh, six months later, uh, in the middle of my senior year, I gave my life to God December 31st, 1999, come on, Y2K, and, um, when I gave my life to God, a, a lot of things began to change, so that, that was heavy in the part of forgiving myself, forgiving my biological father and all those situations, but in addition to all that, uh, my mom, when, um, when I was born, my mom, just a short time later, ended up marrying another man. His name's Terry, uh, who was my stepdad, who's a man I call dad. And for 20 years, I um, uh, lived in the home with him all the way until college. And though him and my mom aren't married anymore, he's still, I still call him dad. I'll call him today on Father's Day. He, my kids call him Papa Terry, and we call him Papa because I was born in Tennessee, and that's the word we use. So um, we, you know, so there was a man who's not biologically my dad who loved me and treated me like a son, and the power of that, I think, is pretty phenomenal and helped me navigate the situation as well. That's awesome. I mean, that's, that's quite a story right there, isn't it? And to, to navigate that and to you to be such a great dad. Shall I just love you guys. And you are, listen, Bobby, you are a phenomenal father. And think about that again, just what you're able to reproduce through your children and the blessing of that. How did you go? You talked about with God. Just for a moment, how did that go? You had to, you had to not just be mad at God? Well, I was, I was mad at God. <laughs> Again, a little heavy here. Um, I was, I remember laying in bed and the thing that frustrated me most is I, I said, I was mad because I felt like God let him die and go to hell. And that was my conversation with God. God, how could you allow him to go to hell? And, um, you know, honestly, I, there was a pastor in my life uh, at that stage in those conversations uh, and uh, he talked me through that and that emotions and that feeling and maybe even my lack of understanding the full breadth of it and the power and the grace of God. Uh, and so I think that pastoral leadership would have been a, a huge factor in helping me navigate that. Um, but then also, I think the other thing was the fact that I was willing to talk to God about it. And I think sometimes when you get mad at God, what we instinctively do is we stop talking. You know, you're mad at your spouse, you stop talking. You're mad at a friend, you stop talking. You're mad at God, you stop talking. But I think the most dangerous thing we can do is stop communicating and stop talking. And so I think that would be wisdom for anybody struggling with forgiveness is start actually communicating to God and talk to him about how you feel. I mean, it's not as if God doesn't already know it anyway. Exactly. And he's waiting for those words to come out. Just roar on it. God's not mad he's not shocked he knows that's awesome come on give Bobby a hand that's a all right so Kino right here Kino Pataiso the thriller from Manila yeah. I love this guy I love him I love his wife um you you never knew your dad um so let's talk about that because I want to I want you to talk a little bit about how has God filled the gaps of never knowing your dad yeah, um, I would start by saying I genuinely believe that uh, the design of God is a mom and a dad in the home, um, but I'm thankful uh, for my single mom who raised me. I, text, I texted her today. Yeah, shout out to single moms in the house. And she did her best. Um, you know, she tried to toughen me up. She would say things to, I think, that she thought would make me a tougher man, uh, wildly inappropriate things. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, and she would randomly like just like shove me. She still tries to wrestle me. I think she can still take me. She's tough. Um, bartender for like decades. Um, but I, I, I noticed like I still I, I grew up and I realized that, you know, I was I was missing out on some things. Um, and then when I came to know Christ in, in years in my life, teenage young adult years where I was searching, you know, for that father figure, maybe even unknowingly. Um, I love that verse that I've really come to know what it is that the, the promise of God fulfilled, that he will put the fatherless into families. 
And so I've come to know not, the, not only the grace that was on my mother in raising me and what I think God can do for single moms, but I've come to know the grace of God that, um, you know, God hasn't only given us a freedom from the penalty of sin, um, but I actually believe that the promise of God is that he would also restore that which the enemy has stolen from us. And as I read my Bible, I, I know that when God restores us, uh, he doesn't only just restore that which we lost, but he adds more blessing onto it. And so when I look at the, the lay of my life, um, you know, my wife and I, we just celebrated 10 years of marriage. Um, so that's longer than any of my mom's previous marriages. Um, I got, we got three beautiful girls, like you said, who are all passionate. They love coming to church, and we want to see them uh, carry that love for all their years, but um, I just want to encourage anyone. Maybe you look at your life and you're like, well, I, I didn't get a fair shake. Yeah, I didn't get the leg up or the advantage that maybe other people have had. I, I want to tell you that God is all about seeing people be trophies of his grace and seeing you blessed and seeing promises fulfilled in your life. Awesome, King. So I want to ask you a question, and I, and I think I, I, I know you, and I want you to just for a minute share about this. What did, how did you learn healthy fathering with no role model? How did you learn that? Yeah, I mean, I think before I came to, to Christ, I definitely had some role models. They were just not good ones. They were um, on the streets, you know, <laughs> like uh, I was trying to imitate something, anything. Um, and um, the truth is the, the culture, the world is not providing healthy role models um, for people without dads. And so I found myself, I, I came into church and I had all kinds of these, these people in my life who were instructors. Paul rebuked the Corinthian church and said, among you, you have like thousands of instructors, but not many fathers. And so I actually, it was the first time coming into church that I actually got exposed to what a spiritual father could look like. I mean, one of the first ones was my CG leader. Shout out to all the CGs. Yeah. Look how happy they sound. Um, and I had a guy who was my age, who I remember in high school, um, you know, partaking upon some things that, you know, I should not have, and seeing him in church right after I gave my life to Jesus, inviting me to his Bible study, his community group. And I was just like floored. And though he was my age, he started talking to me about Jesus. He gave me my first Bible. He was reading the Bible. And I was just like floored. And then just coming into church, I got a chance to really see what I would call the spiritual father in my life, Pastor Steve. And I didn't have direct access to Pastor Steve in the beginning, um, but I got a chance to observe and from afar, indirectly, learn how to be a spiritual dad. I'm talking, I'm still stealing some of the greatest hits from Pastor Steve. Show me happy, come on, that is a, that's a banger in my house it's right Josh's there. That's Josh's favorite. That's a banger, that hits every time uh, in my house, and I just, I just wanted to steal and glean from you and to the point where now I've, I've had a chance and opportunity to kind of walk in spiritual sonship. And I've just looked at your marriage, how you've raised your children, and um, I really believe that God has more than restored. He's abundantly blessed me to equip me to be the dad that's going to raise the generations to come in Christ. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, Kino, you said that you texted your mother today on I Father's did. Day. I did. Yeah. That's awesome. Because I got a really nice text from my son, yeah. Sam, and just saying, Happy Father's Day. Hope I can be half the dad you have been. And then my daughter, Alyssa, she texted me. And I'm just looking. I don't have any texts from you, Josh. I don't see anything. <laughs> oh, there should be one coming through right about now. <laughs> I literally just got the text. What's it say? <laughs> Love you, your favorite son. Wow. Okay, uh, let's keep going then. Okay, here we go. So, <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's, again, these guys have got incredible stories because I think sometimes we look at somebody who's a pastor and we just think they've got it all together and they've got nothing. And I'm praying today that we actually are encouraged and we get perspective that we can all be great fathers no matter what's in your past, no matter what father you did or didn't have. And these are incredible stories. This guy here, Josh Coxwell, your father was a Navy dad. And if I got this right, was deployed for six years of your life, not just in the Navy six years, but was away at the, some of the most formative years of your life. And your mother passed away 
when you were 16 and your dad marries someone who has all sorts of just life controlling habits, which created a huge rift in your family. How did you deal with that? Yeah, so my, uh, my dad got out of the Navy when I turned 16 in June, and then my mom passed away in a car accident that October. And so just dealing with the heartbreak of losing his wife of 20 years at the time, uh, my dad kind of went through a, a season where he didn't know what to do with himself. He didn't know how to be. He didn't know how to be a dad. He had been gone for so much of our upbringing. And when he was here, he's a great dad and sacrificed a lot for our family. But just dealing with that heartbreak, I don't think he knew what to do. And so um, it came a season after my mom passed away where my dad would, I'd seen him for about an hour a day over the period of about eight months where he would come home and just couldn't deal with the heartbreak of not uh, be, being in the house that him and my mom built together and raised us kids in. And so at the end of that, um, he met a woman in a bar, brought her home, and she, uh, unbeknownst to us, had some hidden addiction issues. They ended up getting married, and um, through the season of challenges, cho he chose her time and time again over trusting what we, what we were saying. And so there came a point where I graduated college, and I moved out, and I realized that I could not stay active in that relationship until things changed. Um, and so for me, I essentially had to, like Kina was saying, identify men in my life who I wanted to replicate my life after. And so coming to church and finding guys who were living life the way that I wanted to live life. And I remember I was thinking about it during the last service. Uh, I was 18. I joined the security team. I had no dress clothes. I had nothing, not, you know, our security team likes to dress nice. And I showed up my first Sunday in black jeans and a polo shirt. And my team leader, his name was uh, John. He was a great member of our security team. He's like, hey, look, I noticed you're not wearing the uniform. Let me take you shopping. I didn't even know we have a uniform. Well, you look, awesome. yeah, yeah, but he took me shopping and bought me the clothes I needed because he knew that I couldn't afford them at the time. And I remember, like, there's moments like that throughout my entire upbringing where God brought men alongside me to help raise me and, you know, fill in some of the voids. And my dad and I have since reconciled. I, uh, we were actually building a dining room table for his house. And I remember just sitting there thinking, like, man, like, I can't imagine the heartbreak he went through in losing my mom because she was the love of his life. You know, uh, Chris Hodges has a joke that he says where he talks about, I, didn't, I don't have four kids because I love kids. I have four kids because I love my wife. And uh, that was my dad. Like, he, again, great dad, but really loved my mom. And so... He didn't know how to deal with that heartbreak, and it left a huge void for us kids. Um, when I hear you say that, one of the things I hear is a mark of a maturity, because you, you're also showing grace and compassion and understanding to your father. Uh, and obviously, that's something you've learned over time as you grow. Um, and there's a lot of grace there, and I, I appreciate that, because I think sometimes some sons and daughters um, can be a little too harsh on their, on their dad, but you've come to a place of realizing he lost the love of his life. Now, that created complications for you, and you've had to navigate that. But well done. That's a mark of maturity, isn't it? Yeah. So the family and family tension and strife, how did you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, honestly, for a season for me, it was stepping away from it um, and really getting to a place where I could develop me in a way that was healthy and reflected the life that I wanted to live. But coming back to my dad, it was about two years ago that we had that conversation where I just told him, like, look, I, you know, I've held resentment against you. And we were still in contact, still went to family events and stuff, but that father-son relationship definitely wasn't where it would be in a healthy relationship. And so uh, I just went to him, and he didn't even know that I had felt that way. In his mind, you know, like, I know things aren't right, but I didn't know that's how he felt. And so we were able to reconcile and um, we could tell him, look, I forgive you. Like, I'm not, I don't expect anything of you, but I love you. And, yeah. That's amazing. I mean, you know, uh, I, these stories can be replicated a um, hundred times. But I think it really helps us all sit in the room here and realize, you know what? God is a father to the fatherless. And these stories. And, Joe, I want to get to you because, Joe, you're part of our preaching team and your family broke up when you were 13 due to gambling uh, your dad embezzled half a million dollars family lost all its money you actually testified against your dad in court um, just tell us your story tell us how are you with all that yeah my uh, my father 
um, came to Christ when he was on his way to Norfolk for a substantial drug deal. Um, he had been in the Navy before that. Um, his skills and what he was doing in the Navy at the time, uh, they had use of him in the intelligence community, so he spent a lot of time in Africa at that stage in the Cold War. Uh, someone approached him and told him he could make a lot more money using the skills he was using in the military for organized crime. And this was before my dad knew Christ, so he said, sounds great. So he got out, was doing that. And he was on his way to Norfolk, Virginia for a, a very large drug deal when um, his sister reached out to him again, shared Christ with him, and he made a decision to follow Christ. And he never showed up for the drug deal. Um, the drug deal was there, the, the police were there that day and everyone that did show up was apprehended. Um, so this organized crime group thought my father snitched him out. So my dad was on the run for multiple years and they finally caught him in a hotel lobby, um, did a hit, left him for dead. He survived, he had to drive himself to the hospital and he collapsed from blood loss in the ER. Um, started following Christ, uh, began to put his life back together again, met my mother in church. Um, but his job began to take him for trade shows to Las Vegas around the time I was 10 years old. By 13, he had full-blown gone back to his old life, unbeknownst to any of us. Um, he embezzled all the family's money away. My father completely unilaterally managed my family's finances. Um, I remember being told, when you choose to go to college, money won't be a problem. Just choose where you want to go. To hide the money he lost, he then started taking money from his company to the tune of half a million dollars. Um, federal case, everything repossessed. Um, and for some other things that he did, I had to testify in court against him. Um, so that's really how my journey started there. In terms of how I'm doing with all that, um, just amazed at the goodness of God. I think for a lot of years, I was in a holding pattern because I tried to act like it never happened. And then I realized that God doesn't erase what happens. He uses what happens to us. And that's far more powerful. Anyone can pretend like something didn't happen. And you know, the world has that saying, fake it until you make it. But I was, that was not working. And what happened was I, I began to understand God is greater than what happened to me. And I learned to walk with the holy limp. You know, in the same way that you look at a person with a scar, it shows life happens but they were healed, um, I learned to embrace those things and realize God can, God can use this, but no, not for one second did he cause it. And so that has led to a journey of, of knowing who I am in Christ and that what happens to me doesn't have any more authority than I surrender to it in Jesus' name. So that'd be how I'm doing. So talk to me about you being a dad, because you guys, these guys are all great fathers. Let me tell you something. They are amazing fathers. None of them's perfect, but you're all great dads. So you think about that for all you guys with your family origin, family background. You know, I, I guess my thinking is, you know, what helped you to get healed and whole to be such a great dad that you are today? Yeah, I, I think it would be two things. I think one, I learned to look at my life more through the gospel. What does the work of Jesus' death and resurrection have to say about what I'm going through right now? And I realized I was putting so many boundaries on how the message of the gospel works in my life. I saw it as only working in this one little area. And yet on the journey, I had to realize, no, my entire life is in the shadow of the cross and in, in the reality of an empty grave. And allowing that truth to work into even this area of my being and my identity. Because it's been in different seasons. I've had to wrestle with it in different ways. Um, when I chose to marry my wife, when my kids were born, those watershed moments where I would hear my friends around me celebrating with their dads. And my dad was nowhere to be found. Um, learning to take those moments to Jesus. And uh, I think the other thing, it's actually something that I learned um, from someone in the defense establishment, his name was Colonel Boyd. He had the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. And uh, I just learned to take a, a step back, dial back the intensity of moments where I knew it was a trap stick for me. Like with my dad embezzling money, finances were a major insecurity point for me for a very long time. I had a lack mentality, and that came out of my family upbringing. 
And so learning to observe the warning signs when I was starting to go down that path, orient what is the gospel response, decide that is what I'm going to believe, and then act on it. And the more you work through that cycle, O-O-D-A, UDA, um, I realized the more I was able to think biblically, and that has helped me to grow over the years. What a great story these guys are bringing today. Let me, let me close it out with each of you. Um, if you had just one piece of wisdom to everybody here today, everybody online, to all of our campuses who are listening today, and I'm really believing this is going to be one of those Father's Day's messages that absolutely is going to be a defining moment. And actually, I'm really praying that this will go viral, that this will give so much hope to so many people because we can look at our life and think how, how, how hurt we are, how... How, how disadvantaged we are, and we can look at someone else's life through the filter that is not real. And that's why I wanted to do this today, is get these guys up here and just be really open, honest, and authentic about your life and what you've had to navigate. So Josh, starting with you, one piece of wisdom that you would say to dads today. Yeah, my piece of wisdom today uh, is something that is, I believe, is, is really simple and, and practical but I believe it's powerful. I've met a lot of great fathers, and one of the things that they all have in common is they were all accountable. I think as, as men and as dads, oftentimes, if we're not careful, we don't talk about things until it's too late uh, to talk about. Um, and I believe as dads, spiritually, we hold the keys to the front door of our families. What a humbling responsibility that is. And our families are way too important for us to think that we don't need accountability in our lives. God has called you as a dad or a spiritual dad, but he didn't call us to do it alone. And so I'd encourage any dad here today is, is make sure we've got accountability in our lives. So what you're saying is who is there in your life that you can take the mask off? Mm -hmm. Someone you can talk to. Yep. And just, you know, someone that's going to be able to hold your feet to the fire, but it's up to you to initiate that. Right. Obviously, we're first accountable to our spouses, but do we have guys in our life who know our weaknesses and who can let us know and call us out when we need to be called out. Yeah, because I think sometimes we have a wrong definition of accountability. And let's be honest, President Clinton was had accountability at the wazoo, but he still messed up. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's not that kind of accountability where it's government, legislation. Do you know what I'm saying? It's actually hard, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, that's good, Josh. I like that. Bobby? Yeah, I would say perspective is powerful. Um, I've heard it said like this, we judge others by their actions while judging ourselves by our intentions. Uh, and when we think about like things of forgiveness and things of moving forward, uh, considering that uh, we are human beings who do need the grace uh, of God, you know, there's a, there's a scripture that my wife quotes often, and it's Job 8, 6, and 7. It says, for if you are pure and live with complete integrity, he will rise up and restore your happy home. And though you started with little, you will end with much. And I think it's just that reminder of let's run our race that God's called us to. Remember that it's only by the grace of God we have the things we have. And I believe that's key uh, to being who God's called you to be. One more time, that scripture, Job. 8, 6, and 7. For if you are pure and live with complete integrity, he will rise up and restore your happy home. And though you started with little, you will end with much. Beautiful. Kino. Uh, yes, I am the dad. My oldest is six. So here's a big thing my wife and I practice. Find dads that you admire and just figure out how you can copy them. Uh, Paul often said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so for me, I'm, I, I find dads, and it takes getting over my own ego, right dads? Um, to be able to say, hey, I like how your kids worship, the fact that they even worship. Um, I love how your kids behave. I love how your, your kids speak to you. Um, I love how your kids text you on Father's Day, all kinds of stuff that you admire. It's text you on yeah. Father's uh -huh. Day. That's, that's Figure a Figure out. And I, I even got a text from Laurie, my daughter and all. You're struggling, bro. <laughs> and um, my wife and I will literally just say, how can we learn from you? Teach us. So just being teachable. Yeah, I love that. And you know, that takes a real man to do that, by the way. That's what I say. Well, no, it does. Because here's what happens. We all think we've got to be ourselves. We've got to be authentic. But what you're saying is observe, watch. Who's doing this well? and learn from them and don't be insecure enough to go, there's nothing someone can't teach me. If someone's got a strength somewhere, yeah. and you, did you quote that verse? Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's right. Yeah, awesome. Joe. I would just encourage that really give special attention to your definition of success. 
Because if you're working to the wrong definition, you'll miss the mark. You'll miss the mark. And the world, if you allow it to, will define success for you. And that is a fool's errand. It will never hit its true mark. And Jesus said, there's a lot of people out there building their lives on wood, building their lives on hay, building their lives on stubble. And as fathers, I believe our ultimate responsibility is to prepare our children to one day look their creator in the eyes for all of eternity. My job more than anything is to prepare my children for eternity. So making sure we have the right definition of success. Joe, that's brilliant. I remember when Shall I were really wrestling with a call to pastor in the United States. As clear as anything, I sat down with someone that Kino, you talked about, when you find someone that you admire, we found someone that we admired, Wayne and Len Alcorn. And I said, Wayne, uh, I've been asked to uh, travel all over the country, preach and teach, uh, but I know God's called me to pastor in America. And he, and he, and he said to me, he says, Steve, what, I'll never forget it. He goes, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? That there isn't a church or a pulpit he's not asked to speak in, but loses his children. And he goes, what matters the most is your family. It pulled me up, Joe, to understand what really matters and so what success is, the wood, hay, and stubble um, versus making sure you take your family with you. So that's, that's awesome. Josh. Yeah, I would say find out what it means to be the spiritual leader of your home. I really like what Josh said about we're the gatekeepers to our homes and how we go to war in the spirit, how we pray, really is going to be what protects our family from the advances of the enemy. And so uh, I'm in the season now where I'm teaching my soon-to-be three-year-old how to pray. And I found that when I pray with her, she loses attention or I wake her up because I I sing her to sleep at night. And um, I've had to start singing prayers over her. And so some nights I'll run out of things to say, so I'll sing in the spirit and it it might sound funny to you guys, but uh, it soothes her to sleep and she doesn't have nightmares when I do it, but sometimes when I don't, she does. So I'm just gonna say it works. But um, just find out what works for you and praying for your family. Don't just pray these, you know, cheap prayers and throw away prayers. I'll help you have a good day tomorrow, you know, good night's sleep, but like prophesy, speak to your children, call out the man and woman of God in them so that as they raise up, you know, we had, we had all this list from when our daughter was, we were pregnant with her to what she would look like, how she would behave. And I kid you not, they're the same thing. Like yeah. the list in her are the same and really just praying those prayers of faith over her. So I just be the spiritual leader. See, Josh, I need to sing over you. Yeah, you could probably just text that to me and that would work too. <laughs> hey, did you enjoy this today? Come on, online, all the campuses. Joe, we're going to hand...